Hi all. Welcome uh, to Assessment Systems webinar, Talent Discoveries. My name is Violetta Lucic. I am a country manager of Assessment Systems Adria, and uh, I will be the one facilitating the, today's session. So first of all, a couple of, couple of technical things. Uh, I would like to invite you to be uh, open, to pose the question, do, uh, questions during the whole session, of course, and we will do our best to try to answer them. Of course, at the end, uh, we will have, uh, we have scheduled uh, Q&A, but please feel free to reach out to us to give your comments and, as I said, to pose the questions during the webinar itself. So, today we will be speaking uh, a bit more about uh, talent discoveries. So how do we identify talents? What we are doing with them within the company? We will share some of the experiences that we as a consulting company had with our clients, but also I am very happy and very excited that some of our clients are here with us today and they will be giving you first-hand information about uh, what is happening within uh, their own companies and how do they tackle uh, talent discoveries. So, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to invite our guests to present themselves. Thank you, Violeta. My name is Dora Ferenczi. I'm uh, working as a talent uh, program manager at OTP. Um, I have about 14 years experience in the banking sector. Uh, I was um, uh, working as an HR professional in um, learning and development, and I have um, uh, some years experience uh, as a business partner. And uh, currently uh, we are uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, forming, uh, let's say, new approach, a new concept on talent uh, development in the, in the OTP bank. Actually, that was part of my uh, career previously. Uh, of course, I was uh, dealing with talent selection, development, and also the retention part. Um, and actually, I also participated in talent programs, so I have personal experience from that as well. <laughs> And thank so, you for being here. Thank you, Dora. So, so we can we can hear uh, some of your thoughts from both ends of the process. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, then maybe me as next. Uh, my name is Kata Schonfei, and I'm Hungarian as well. But I'm living in the Netherlands, and I work for in a German organization in Deutsche Telekom. I'm a talent broker right now. Um, but I have also about 16 years of experience within Deutsche Telekom mainly as business partner and as competence center colleague. In the last five years, I was working on talent management uh, projects and I have uh, done a lot of assessment. During my career within Telecom, I was also a member of a, uh, of a talent program, just like Dora. Uh, so that is something that we share and we just are um, experiencing the first results of a new concept that we have implemented. Great. Thank you, Kata. I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more in detail about it. And um, Gabor, as a gentleman, the last one, um, could you please tell us a few words about yourself and afterwards maybe to share some uh, ideas, some thoughts and some of the experiences that we had. So how do we, as an assessment systems, approach uh, talent management when working with our clients and our partners? Yeah, um, so thank you very much, Violetta. And just a couple of words about myself. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'm Gabor Fuzer. Uh, I'm also Hungarian. I'm working uh, at Assessment Systems Hungary. I'm leading uh, our Hungarian office, but I'm also uh, a consultant here because I always wanted to do this job, uh, not just leading companies and people, but also uh, helping clients uh, doing some consultancy, etc., etc. Actually, as long as I know myself, uh, uh, I'm working with talents and, and leaders because my father is also uh, a leader in <clears throat> his own company. So, um, well, maybe that's all about me and let's jump into the middle of it. Uh, as Violetta just said, uh, before uh, our discussion, um, I wanted to show you something we experience, we see, some of them are, are facts, some of them are just, you know, discoveries, uh, some of them are just what we see and what we can uh, find out based on uh, our experiences. 
So let me introduce the topics actually we'll talk uh, about later in our discussion. So uh, I would say that the first uh, thing is uh, why are we talking about it? Why are we talking about uh, uh, talents? And I guess that all these sentences here are easy to agree with. Uh, I also would say that they are timeless, uh, at least in the last 30, 40 years, uh, as long as there is HR and, and all these positive things about people in the workplace. Uh, but they are also somewhat bullshit, like uh, I know. Uh, however, I have to tell you that it still happens that if we approach talent management and, you know, certain people in certain companies, uh, certain leaders came back to us and tell us that, hey, uh, okay, let's, let's uh, find out that we train people, but, but, but if, if they leave, uh, so if you know the famous anecdote, we always uh, turn this sentence back and ask them, okay, let's imagine that you don't train or develop them and they stay. And usually that's the end of this kind of uh, discussion about uh, uh, the needs uh, um, <clears throat> and the reasons why we have to, you know, gather, select, train, whatever, develop uh, our people, our key people. So, but uh, uh, actually, as I've said, these are timeless sentences. So let's see some facts, why it is really important, why we right now talking about this uh, uh, topic in <clears throat> 2021, um, September. So we actually perceive many things uh, uh, on the market, uh, but we wanted to, you know, somehow uh, bring some facts for you. So that's why we relied on Willis Tower Watson survey, uh, where you can see that many other companies uh, uh, really feel that this is a very difficult topic, and it's even more difficult than in the past years. Um, so if you would like to see these reasons, then you can uh, read these sentences uh, um, on the right hand side. And well, as you can see, uh, most of them are related to COVID. Um, so yeah, COVID is, is changing the world, also changing and affecting uh, talent management. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but not is but things that are not in this uh, picture is that we have also experienced that, for example, many companies uh, had to skip talent management programs last year because of you know shortages, because of you know uh, uh, restructuring, because of replanning, et cetera, et cetera. So for many of them, uh, this is the first year after 2019 where they have to certain part in that. Uh, so they, they told us in many cases that because people are working from home, they don't have so much experience with them uh, to, you know, accurately identify uh, someone's talent, uh, uh, performance, etc. <clears throat> so uh, facts about uh, uh, this year, facts about uh, uh, current things, Let's have some extra ammunition. But to be honest, um, <clears throat> I have to tell you that there is nothing uh, new under the sun since the Greek, uh, which means that it's not just, you know, an extra difficult topic right now because of COVID. It is a difficult topic uh, uh, in the last five or maybe six years. Um, you can see some even more extra ammunition here. Uh, and maybe you know us, at least me, uh, some of you. Uh, I'm a fan of Thomas Chamorro and his book uh, called Talent Delusion, where he basically pointed out these things uh, in, <clears throat> uh, how was that, like four or five years ago. Uh, so there's nothing new. Uh, we know that we have some problems uh, with talent management and, and Chamorro, uh, because of that, uh, uh, came out uh, with a new approach that it's not a war for talent, it's a war on talent. Because actually we, uh, also including consultants and companies, look like we are losing this kind of war um, for these talents. That's why it looks like a war on talent. Sometimes we are fighting them instead of, you know, retaining and... and <clears throat> finding them. So um, some of these uh, numbers are also very lovely, of course, in brackets. I especially like uh, uh, the second one, which says more than 50% of the people would change their uh, um, professional position uh, if they could. Uh, and I agree that at first look, it looks, wow, brutal number. But it's really true. Uh, many people simply uh, are unable to change. But that's 
how they feel. And actually, we had a chance to, to support uh, a special program at one of our clients these times, where the company, a big one, uh, offered a program uh, for basically everybody in the company to be retained, retrained into uh, software developers. And everybody, basically everybody could apply uh, from sales, from customer service, from other technical fields to be retrained. And they are actually paying the bills uh, for this. Uh, people will receive uh, salaries throughout, uh, you know, the education period. And after that, they will have uh, uh, a stable new position in the same company. They don't have to go outside the company, uh, advertise themselves on the market. They will have this uh, uh, secure position. So I really feel that this is a very lovely uh, example of how uh, companies are also approaching this in new ways, uh, uh, <coughs> talent management. So um, when we're talking about Chamorro, uh, then of course we also want to talk about who is a talent, uh, uh, how can we consider uh, someone. And however, I know that from a certain point of view, it's a pointless discussion because there are different you know, viewpoints, different approaches, and actually there is basically no need to have one stable definition. But Something is maybe uh, still relevant, and I like Chamorro's approach because it's it's holistic and abstract enough. So if you look at the first two uh, approaches, the few and the so-called uh, row model, you can see that these are very abstract things. Uh, not really talking about specific competencies, not really pointing out uh, specific people. But what I found. Uh, um, as a consultant is that, you know, we are doing talent management uh, in many companies. We are, you know, working with different sets of competencies, et cetera, et cetera. But these two models can really help us and help companies uh, to somehow validate what they have found. I mean, you know, look at the first one. Uh, if you have 100 people in your company and at the end of uh, the day you have uh, 50 talents, then hmm, maybe it's too much because it should be around 20%. Or if you announce the talent program and there is only five people from 100 applying to it, then maybe we should still uh, focus on the communication because it has to be around uh, 30%. So these big things might validate. The same is true for the role model. As I've said, we have thousands of competencies we are working together. Yes, we can group them, but actually when I have a list of uh, competencies a company is looking for or assessing or developing or whatever, I always check it with this role model. Is, are there competencies about you know, interpersonal skills? Uh, are there competencies about learning and expertise? And is this willing uh, uh, part of the, of the competency set of the model to be driven, to be result oriented, uh, et cetera? So again, these things might help uh, uh, you and us as well if we have a specific uh, custom talent competency or talent program. And the last one is also very, very important. Uh, of course, Chamorro was not uh, really talking about it. It looks obvious uh, that I am, so the talent has to identify himself or herself as a talent as well. But in the last years, we have found that sometimes this can be uh, a problem as well, that we see that someone is a talent, but up until that person is not considering himself or herself as a talent, we still have uh, a problem or, or a difficult situation. So they really have to, uh, you know, reach this level. And sometimes we really have to help them. Uh, that's what I uh, wanted to tell with this. So let's imagine that we have the talent. <clears throat> of course, we have to talk about the stakeholders. You know, if you have the person and pull the person in the company, you know, company is a system, is a network. If you pull one string, there will be several other strings pulled as well. So it's a good question. Uh, who is the uh, stakeholder? Actually, we can also leave with the answer, everybody uh, in the company around us. Uh, but actually, I think it's, it's worth uh, uh, discussing because uh, it's not really just about HR and the talent themselves, but many, many other players are in this equitation on this uh, uh, play field. So uh, we'll talk about stakeholders as well. And let's see something about the process. Um, of course, this is something we have created. This is also very abstract. And actually what I wanted to highlight here uh, as important things uh, uh, for you, for us right now is that, you know, Accelerate, which is about the development and the training and the assess part is you know, obvious, but 
how to say it, a well-constructed talent management program or something should really focus on, on uh, the other three stages as well, like architect, activate and assure. Because this activate is, is something that we wanna really highlight that it has to be connected to, to the strategy, to the vision. And some companies simply skip it. Uh, we feel that it's not that good. Activation is what I'm actually talking uh, uh, on the last slide. Sometimes people really have to activate themselves and we have to help them to activate themselves, to, to consider themselves as talents. And assure, assurance is, you know, something like a remeasuring uh, uh, the program, the people uh, in it. It should not end uh, with the development. Uh, uh, I mean, the cycle. And as you can see, everything is in one circle. So after, you know, measuring, actually it starts over and over uh, again. So this is all about the process. And uh, as you could see, development uh, develop is part of the process. I would say it's not a question, but it's even more interesting to discuss how to develop and, and what to develop. So these are the real challenges when it comes to uh, development. <clears throat> and this is the budget heavy part, uh, but we have found as well. Of course, sometimes assessment uh, uh, is also uh, heavy, but this part is, is heavy and also very, very important because this is the investment part. Uh, to be honest. So we are also seeing some repeating patterns in, in certain models uh, uh, because there are similarities uh, in the environment, you COVID, uh, agile, etc. So that's what I've said that in many cases we see that competencies are coming back and back and back again. Maybe not the same, you know, words, but the same uh, phenomena. Um, but let's discuss it because uh, uh, it's a huge uh, area. And actually, uh, this is it. So let me stop here and let me give the word back to Violetta uh, to start the discussion about all these things uh, I, I wanted to touch. I wanted to ping a little bit. Thank you very much, Gabor. It was, it was very uh, uh, concise, but also thorough. So basically we could see uh, uh, in your speech that there are always some universal things in the talent management program, but of course, uh, there are different spices in each of the companies, in each of the approaches. So I'm wondering, and I would like to ask uh, our guests, so what are the, uh, the models you are experimenting with currently? What were you re reviewing in your practice? So what is actually going on now uh, related to the talent management within your companies? Okay, I'm, I'm starting it uh, because um, I think uh, uh, we are now in the phase um, which uh, could be a beginning of, uh, of a process and Kata can give uh, a little bit more uh, because she had uh, the full process <laughs> in her experience. So uh, what I can say uh, that um, currently uh, we are trying to uh, to make a totally new concept of, uh, of uh, our talent management. And uh, what is really important, what I think is really important is that uh, um, the talent uh, management could fail because in some companies, it's uh, rather about uh, forming talent programs, but talent management is not about talent programs. It's also about that cycle, what uh, Gabor just mentioned, uh, that you have to identify the talents, you have to develop the talents, you have to engage them and give them opportunities to, um, to find new challenges uh, for them. And, uh, and in the banking sector, we can say that it's, uh, it's a really uh, transforming uh, period that we have. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, changes. So we should, uh, we should look at the trends, uh, what we really need. And um, what I think it's, uh, is important that uh, we are um, working together with, uh, with an uh, international uh, working group uh, according to, to talent uh, management. And we, we are trying to find those, uh, let's say, main uh, similarities and um, uh, common uh, thoughts that, that we can have in all uh, countries in the group. 
and uh, it is important to form the meaning of the talent, what you can say. And currently, I think that's a, that's a, a good question again, because uh, you can say that, okay, you choose 20% of your colleagues and uh, say that they are the talents, but what would you say for the others? It's not easy to find uh, uh, good colleagues uh, right now, especially in those areas where we, all know like IT and so on. Uh, so, so we were uh, started to think about, okay, uh, we would like to find those who, who have uh, the potential, but we, we would like to say that, okay, everybody could be a talent. So that's something that, that was coming in, in the conversations, for example, in the international um, uh, meetings. Uh, on the other hand, of course, we have to, to see uh, what challenges we face, for example, how we can give the opportunities for, uh, for our talents. And the example you mentioned, Gabor, was really um, uh, something that, uh, that was coming in, into our mind as well, uh, that uh, we have to retain retrain the colleagues because new skills are needed in the future. Uh, but I've learned that uh, you uh, partially lose your skills in every four years, which means that you have to uh, ongoing or, or uh, uh, continuously uh, retrain yourself um, and uh, give the opportunities for the colleagues to, to find the new challenges. In the meanwhile, uh, the uh, there is the period where, where bureaucracy and hierarchy is uh, going uh, uh, away from the company. So, of course, we are on the way to make our organizations more flat, which means that maybe we don't have that much managerial positions that, that they were available in the past. So we have to handle somehow these questions when we are talking about talent management. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank you, touched so many topics. Very, very interesting. <laughs> that I also wanted to address. I mean, in our right. case, um, when we were designing our our new talent management program, what we were facing, and that was around two years ago, uh, two three years ago, is that we realized that we did have a very generic translation of what talent is. But it also meant that everybody understood it different, and because there was no assessments, nothing behind we got a huge pool of, um, of employees in this, in this uh, program, which all were different qualities and they had no relation, neither about their ambition nor about their skills related to the corporate strategy. So Gabor, when you show the, the process, yes, it is important to have this process, but the most important is that, that it is all deeply ingrained uh, or embedded into what the company wants to achieve. And um, because of that, because they were so differently skilled and so different ambitious, we also saw that our success result within that one year period, which we tr yeah, traditionally had, right? The one year cycle, we couldn't achieve successes with placing them, moving them around. Mm -hmm. So that was one of, of the issues as well, which then, I mean, it created high level of dissatisfaction from the people who participated in a talent program, right? And with that kind of frustration, you lose even the ones that you have selected with a good intent. Um, and then, yeah, what did we do? Indeed, Dora, everybody has talent. Ideally, you don't have anyone on your payroll who is not using their talents for your work and your, your purpose. And I mean, there are performance cases always, but let's say everybody is hired for their, their talents. But we now also say that we only want to have people in our program who have skills and uh, ambition to grow towards roles that are critical for the future of the company. Um, and that is really bad news for financial controllers, for instance, because there's many of them and it's quite easy to learn. And it's a big opportunity for anyone who is willing um, to learn or has knowledge in needing in software skills, in IT, in network, uh, in digital commercial skills and so on. But if you don't have that agility, that's a problem. And that's what then connects to, for instance, um, the idea of Chamorro with the, with the role model. So we, what is the, the model we looked at? And we said, we actually want to mix this. So we're also looking for the IM factor, 
but it doesn't need to be too much I am because then it's, it's going to be arrogance, right? And high expectations. But there has to be a healthy balance of I am, but it also has to be raw. Mm -hmm. um, and it, we find that this kind of mix is a healthy mix of identifying who is worth talking to right now. Thank you, Kata. You gave us a, a pretty good explanation who talent is. Uh, in your company, for example. But well, that's a funny thing. So we, sorry, Violeta, because yes, yes. there's one more thing I want to mention. As we say that everybody has talent, uh, our programs are not looking for talent, but for growth potential. So we are also super clear about it, that you cannot assess talent, for instance, or we don't want to, let's say this way. I, I wouldn't like to say you cannot. You can look for all kinds of things, depending on, on what you call talent. Uh, but we really look for potential. We assess potential in different kinds of ways to, to have facts and figures about what we can achieve with the people we start to work with. That's great. Can you tell us a bit more on how do you uh, assess potential? Just a few yeah. sentences. Yeah, so uh, we do have a, a process behind it. So on one hand, uh, when we start the, the whole story, we have clear picture about what are those critical roles within the company that we are looking for. For. Uh, so on a, or even a, almost on a job description level, so a little bit um, high level job description level, so that we can identify at the moment of application if someone is already fitting. And so it's first a CV scan uh, after application and people can be nominated by management, but we are also open for self-nomination because we want that I am factor. Um, we don't push this program to anyone. So it's totally voluntary if they apply or not. Um, once you have applied and you have sent your CV and we see their traces of topics that are interesting for future, then they get an invitation to my assessment, which is a combination of personality tests and cognitive skills. Um, we find that cognitive skills are also super important threshold of, threshold of growth for, uh, for people. Um, and then we go further and uh, we either give feedback about this assessment and the CV to be able to develop on, a, on their own of, or if the results show that there's potential, there's a structured interview to gather even more um, uh, background about the candidates. That it's not mm -hmm. just this digital insight, but uh, also the human sensing, right? That's part of my job um, as a broker. And with all this whole picture together, then together with the business, so we go to business leaders and we say, we have found someone very interesting. How do you see them? Do you have references about them? Do you find their profile interesting? Should we work with them? And the business is the one who finally says, yes, we would like to have these people in, in the program. Thank you, Katrin. You mentioned uh, uh, being a talent broker. It's not, a, it's not a common position that we hear about a lot. Can you tell us a bit more? What does it mean to be a talent broker? Yeah, it's, it's threefold. So in the beginning, what I was mentioning before, in, in the early process, in the identification straight, stage, it's really assessment and, and giving feedback based on assessment. So that's where I'm a little bit in, into your area and your, your profession and skills. Not as if I was as, you know, in the level or, or so, but it's still, um, that is what, what we do. And then after that, when we get into the hub itself, to our, our talent hub, then we are career coaching our talents in a very intense collaboration. So really over a series of sessions and months of, of working, and we create a career plan. And after that, we are also kind of headhunter, internal headhunter, using our network, finding opportunities, sensing what is happening in the organization and where are the opportunities for our, for our members of, of the hub to, to apply for, where we can open doors for them, where they have to walk through finally and, and get the opportunity. Thank you, Kata, that sounds, that sounds interesting. And uh, the next question is related. Uh, we were, Gabor was mentioning, and you also tackled a bit, uh, the key stakeholders in the process. How do you see it, uh, Dora, Kata, whoever wants, uh, who are actually the key st stakeholders in the process of talent management? Actually, um, if we are talking about uh, stakeholders, I have to mention the managers because I think uh, this is the most important uh, thing that uh, managers should feel that it's their responsibility 
uh, not, not just uh, to find uh, the talent, but uh, but also to develop, to give feedback, and uh, to make them uh, able to find new challenges, which means that they have to uh, see it in a uh, in a bigger perspective and not just uh, making their own uh, organizational unit um, uh, a good performer unit but uh, they have to uh, they have to give the opportunity for a talent to find uh, uh, bigger roles maybe in other organizations and I think this is very important because that's uh, that's a really big change uh, in in the management uh, uh, thinking that, that you yeah in the mindset that you have to think in another way. You cannot be uh, you cannot be so selfish that you you would like to have only your own unit to be uh, very uh, very good, but you have to give the opportunity for the talents. Um, and also what's important from the management side and what we think it's uh, really uh, important for, uh, for, the, for the talent management, what Kata mentioned, that, uh, that you have to uh, embed it into to the corporate uh, strategy. Um, and uh, if we are talking about that, uh, we need to find the connection with the resource planning. And I'm not just talking about uh, how many uh, employees uh, I will need in the next year, but I'm talking about what kind of skills, professional knowledge, and what kind of mixture uh, do, uh, do I need uh, in the next year and in, I don't know, one or two uh, years later on, because uh, these inputs gives us um, how we can plan with developing uh, talents and also, of course, uh, managerial skills. Yeah, I mean, also for us, it is uh, super essential to know what are the, the skills, experiences that, that our future leaders will need. Because without that, you cannot have a long-term relationship with someone and, and develop into. Um, so also career paths are still playing, not rigid career paths like it, it was in old times, but, um, but flexible career paths are playing a big role. And related to what you were mentioning, Dora, just before, um, uh, embedded into, into the strategy, but also the mindset of the leaders, how it's changing. I, th I think it's super important to have a good connection to leadership development and also to the core values of the company, that it is uh, a no-brainer that the leader's role is to create the future of leadership. Uh, kind of guarding them. Our sponsors that we have chosen, they are kind of our alliance partners in, in, this, um, in, this, in, this, in this activity or so. Um, so it is super essential that you really find the good leaders within the organization who have affinity, who have, I call it always the nose for, for the right people to be spotted, to, to, to be attracted, to get to a program and then to nourish and flourish them further, open doors, be kind of guardian angels for them, mentor them when necessary, but also just connect them to the right people uh, so that there are opportunities being created. And this is something that we can influence by hiring the right men, but right leaders, but it also entails leadership development, right? Absolutely, absolutely, Kata. I, I think that uh, Gabor and me have a lot of examples from our everyday uh, practice and work with our clients where we see that sort of, I would call it even a misalignment uh, between, for example, HR and management when, the, uh, when we identify potentials, but managers do not always recognize them. Sometimes uh, it, it, it takes the right uh, mindset and openness towards, uh, uh, or let me even say maybe objectiveness uh, within the process, yeah. So Gabor, do you have some, I, of the, yeah. Yes, <laughs> some of the examples where maybe the key stakeholders that yeah. uh, needed Thank to you. be involved were not? Yeah, so when it comes to stakeholders, you know, uh, I really believe that depending on the program, uh, program sometimes it's it's really everybody. I mean, you know, I just mentioned this career change program uh, for you, where people had a chance to be retrained into uh, software uh, developers. In this case, some uh, departments of the company uh, said that they would like to block themselves and their people from this uh, opportunity, uh, and. 
you know, just, you know, within a blink of an eye, they became uh, key stakeholders, let's say so, in the process. Of course, I had, how to say, a certain smile on my face when I heard this, that some departments are not allowed. I mean, those people, because, you know, I wanted to ask those leaders of these departments, hey, guys, what do you think, what will happen if someone approaches you in your department that I would like to, you know, sneak into this program uh, and you tell this person, no, you cannot. What do you think, what will happen within, you know, some weeks or months with that person? Um, so, yeah, everybody can be um, a stakeholder. And, and sometimes the problem is maybe not, not with the stakeholders itself, but who is it? Uh, because I would say that we all agree that leaders are uh, stakeholders, managers are, but sometimes the problem is that how they think about this, and and sometimes they they resist, uh, you know, participating in it, doing something, not just because they don't want to let their people, but they don't want to do this extra, you know, homework they have to if if they are really part of uh, the program. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Gabor. I, I, I would agree. It sounds familiar. We have one comment. I just would like to read it. So basically, it's a rhetorical question. What is the main difference uh, between real talent and skilled, motivated, high performer? It's very difficult to judge, Joanna Zalewska says. And she says, I agree with Kata. We focus on growth and development of those who want to develop within the organization, not only those who are identified as or labeled as talents. So can I answer this? Because we did, Absolutely. Do, we have a lot of discussions about it because we just started with this new approach and our leaders are used to identifying high performers and even considering that a talent program is a kind of retention for them, right? That it's a goodie, you send them there and then they are happy and they stay, right, Gabor? Because they are in the program so we can, we can, um, we can keep them. And... Um, now we're doing it bit different because we say, yeah, maybe um, uh, your colleague is, is a very reliable performer and you're super satisfied with the person, but if he or she doesn't have the skills that we are uh, really looking for or the desire to grow into and learn them, then sorry, this is not the right thing for them. And besides, our aim, our final target is to place people around the company. So ultimately, whoever gets into this program will move. <laughs> and we know that like for decades, I believe this kind of talent hire, ha hiding is playing a lot. That leaders actually rather do not show who their real good people are that they rely on. Because, oh my God, they will leave. And what will happen then? Um, and that is something that we constantly uh, say that, yeah, maybe your people will leave, but you might also get someone else from us as well. So think about it in a bigger perspective, in a bigger context. Yeah. I, I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, so Dora? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add uh, uh, a comment to this because I, I totally agree and uh, we are also talking about uh, growth potentials and having the drive uh, in, in the, in, within the people. Uh, just one more thing we were uh, talking about with the uh, internal meetings we had is that we should find some uh, principles we would like to uh, keep in the in the talent management and for example uh, one was that uh, that we believe that everybody is responsible for his or her own career which means that uh, okay there is a drive but uh, we really need that uh, somebody uh, would uh, be responsible uh, to find new challenges and to stretch uh, his uh, 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 skills uh, and really uh, grow. So um, these principles, I think, could uh, really uh, just give a, a framework for the uh, for the talent management. Uh, and these goes like this, for example. So this was just coming to my mind. I mean, the the, the responsibility is a very good point. We work with this message for for a while, and we did face the issue actually that. Um, it's not enough to be responsible because if you do not have access, I mean, in our case, Deutsche Telekom is 220,000 employees across 25 countries or so. So it's a labyrinth where you can get lost in, even if you have the self-responsibility to want to find opportunities. And 
that was one of the feedback that there were jobs which were filled before they were advertised because someone knew someone and so on. And those kind of opening the door was required. That's why we created the role of the talent broker, that we would be connecting um, uh, organizations with, with each other, which is super difficult. I mean, I don't say that I'm a polyp uh, reaching out everywhere, but I do have a lot of connections and usually different connections that then the talent, uh, talents in the program. It is very difficult to, uh, to do this responsible activity on your own. I think there needs to be some kind of help and every company has to decide themselves how much they can invest in it because I also have to admit having 14 talent brokers like I am within this company is an expensive game you have to pay our salaries right so that's an investment you do as a support um, for the group that that you select and um, yeah it's a question if, if that is affordable right yeah yeah, not, not uh, every company is ready, but on the other hand, uh, I feel that companies should look, uh, look at it as an investment in the future, not just expense. But okay, uh, you mentioned uh, Kata Learning and uh, Dora, uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, stretching the skills and so on. So tell me a bit more, uh, uh, how do you approach the development or let's say, uh, uh, how, do, how do the chosen talents or potentials, how do you make sure that they live up to their potential? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what type of activities uh, do you have uh, within the company or maybe externally? That's one question. And how do you uh, measure that progress? Yeah. Should I start? You Should can. Thank you. Uh, so it, it's an interesting one. So in, in all times, like when I was a talent, we were sent to Rotterdam to a very nice program of one and a half years. And we learned about strategy and finance and marketing. And we built a good network within the organization. It was fun and many of us have made steps forward. Um, but uh, what we also experience is this, these kind of investments are not always uh, re returning the, the investment. Um, and we rather believe that learning from each other, uh, tapping to the knowledge that is already there because we have uh, very interesting profiles within our hub or learning on the job, having visits, shadowing, um, or even assignments, and then real placements, uh, when you gain the experience, and as I call them, the flight hours, is much more worth than the hours in a, in a, in a school setup. Um, so that's why, that is what we promote. Um, as a talent broker, I'm also, when I'm talking to my, to my talent hub members, I'm constantly think, thinking of, hey, who should I connect them to? And then I'm saying, oh, well, have you talked to this person because you're interested in storytelling and he's so good in it, or you want to know about AI and, um, or, or automation? Ah, oh, that is our expert. He's also in there. I will just write an email and connect you to, you can have a virtual coffee and start exchanging about it. In this way, uh, that kind of knowledge exchange and the transfer and a better understanding of topics and digging into it as much as you want can be done. And besides, we offer a vast amount of learning on our learning platform. So for CPO and Coursera, we have access to, and there you really just choose if you need ex really expert knowledge, you can do courses uh, that, that you can follow. But, but even those courses are too theoretical and the practical knowledge and the insight to the other organization is much more helpful. I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. I just uh, can maybe uh, summarize in some thoughts uh, what you mentioned because, uh, um, as I mentioned, now we are uh, in a, in the making the concept uh, phase. So, uh, but of course, we have uh, and we had in the past different uh, type of talent uh, programs. Uh, what we agreed in the country is that uh, that what's really important in a talent program that we need to. Uh, make the, the space for the collaboration to, to give the knowledge and what's important is that not uh, knowledge is not about uh, uh, giving a course or something but to, to give the, the latest trends on, on, on the things that are coming uh, in the next uh, few years to make the talents be prepared for those, uh, to, to open their eyes 
uh, and let's say give the the burning platform that why should we change and what should we be prepared for uh, of course uh, we should give the experience what just Kata mentioned in uh, concrete placements or uh, let's say assignments uh, and to give uh, the opportunity for expansion uh, to show themselves uh, it's really important. So these are maybe the main main parts of it, and I, I can just connect to Kata in this question. Thank you, thank you, Dora. So uh, in the meantime, Kata answered the question. I wanted to to close this uh, uh, this conversation. Uh, uh, basically, uh, what we are getting close uh, uh, to the end. So uh, I was wondering if you could summarize, and also Gabor, I would like to ask you to share. Uh, some uh, some of your experiences or our experiences. What were and what are the biggest challenges that uh, we can face in the in the talent management programs? What are the biggest uh, I would say missed missteps or examples of bad practice? So, what would you say? And if you had some challenges, uh, if you are willing to share, how did you uh, overcome? those challenges. Gabo, do you start or shall I? Uh, yes, yes, I just I, don't want to steal the... Come to com company experiences. Now, yes. In our cases where we, feel, where we see the challenges still, so on one hand, um, the fact that we are so much related to strategy and business needs and the whole talent topic is owned by the business is something that they have to get used to as leaders. Um, and the engagement is varied. So we have some extremely engaged leaders, really role models in the topic, and there are some who still need to learn this, this situation. And that is part of this transition uh, that we face. The other thing is what we also face as a challenge is that often in our company, we are hiring for experience and not for potential. Mm. Whereas we identify the potential of candidates and we know that they don't fulfill the job description to 100%, but if they do for 80%, then there's a growth potential, a learning potential of 20%, let them give the chance. Mm. Uh, so that is also something that we are constantly still um, struggling with. And the other topic is the expectation management of the members, right? Um, because if they are IM types, uh, sure, they will have their expectations. And um, we also tell that we are not having a yearly cycle anymore. This is a long-term program where we collaborate for really multiple career steps. So it's a much longer perspective. Nevertheless, the idea is that there has to be placement coming in a year or two or something. And if that would not happen, uh, that will be frustrating um, our members as well. And that's a bad word of mouth, which then goes around in the organization. So it can be damaging the program. Absolutely. So we have one question from, from uh, Adam. Uh, he is asking, uh, how can you recognize employees with high growth potential efficiently? Uh, yeah, that's what I said, that on the one hand, it was their uh, history, the achievements from the CV, <coughs> which then we, in the structured interview check, further in depth, what does it mean and what do they deliver and what do they bring with them? And on the other hand, um, also checking um, what is the, the learning capacity of, of the people, the, the learning agility, as I call it, but I'm not sure if everybody is using it. Uh, what is the attitude, the mindset, um, and what is the drive behind? Are they, do they have the right ambition to grow towards the roles that we look at? Mm -hmm. I hope that helps you. Dora, if you, I may, Gabor, yes, do you want to I, add something? If I may add, uh, I totally subscribe to this learning part, how we can identify this. This is actually our solution when someone asks us to, to measure our learning agility or, or this growth potential story that we approach it via learning agility, learning and all these things. So I think it's, it's measurable. And I know it becomes even more and more important. Uh, we have bumped into several companies who said that uh, it's even more important that people actually know right now. Uh, and I'm talking about soft skills, not just hard skills. Uh, so people are prioritized uh, if, if they have bigger potential, even if they have uh, somewhat weaker starting position in terms of soft skills. 
so yeah, uh, that's that's totally it too. Dora, please. Thank you. Uh, no, it, it was just one thing. Um, uh, according to this topic, that uh, for example, you have to uh, look at your own company and not just uh, putting uh, the newest trends in talent management, but to uh, to review what your company really needs. Because for example. Um, uh, in our conversation, in our meetings, it's uh, totally in that we have to put the values uh, in the growth potential uh, as well. So what we would like to uh, find is the performance, the values, how value driven is a person and it's uh, uh, linked to the corporate values plus the drive. Uh, which contains the, the learning ability and so on. So it, this means that, uh, um, that you have to fit uh, the model uh, for your own company. Oh, and by the way, that's a really good call out, uh, Dora, because that also leads to a match into culture. So what, yes. is, what is the direction you want to change the corporate culture and the leadership culture towards? And you have to steer the profile of the candidates towards that profile. Um, and it can be really, really well seen in assessments. Yes. So Kata, there is a, one more question uh, uh, for you. Uh, you answered uh, to Joanna. So uh, Joanna was asking uh, to hear the opinion, does it help to rotate talents frequent, frequently from a different roles and challenge them constantly with the unknown area? Kata answered, uh, that they are not rotating the candidates, rather placing them to the position that provide a healthy challenge. So yeah. we, got a, we got a question. Uh, how do you define a healthy challenge? Uh, uh, Veronica says she understands it as a balance between ambitious and too easy. And do you have something more within your definition or is this it? Yeah, I, I know my talents and I, I also discuss with them um, how much stretch they can handle, uh, and that's that is personal. Uh, it's also you can measure it with how you how you handle change, right? And uh, some people can take on a, a more extreme uh, change, and they even enjoy that they are in a total different environment and out of context, and that they have to learn very fast in a sh in a short moment a lot of things, and other people will be burning from it. And that kind of knowledge is, is, is very important, that you don't put someone into a situation where you burn your talent because that's the worst you can do, right? So that's what I call a healthy challenge, that it fits uh, the number yeah. Yeah, to the individual. And yes, it has to be a stretch. <laughs> but I've heard about healthy challenge. Uh, I read it in, in management literature. It is a different approach that where, where the success chance is between 50% and 66 I know it's very oh, abstract, Interesting. if you can somehow measure the success of the project or task or whatever, this is the healthy uh, thing, not a big and you know, that, interval. <laughs> and that other 33% or 40% can be reduced by even helping. I mean, I also believe that you shouldn't put a talent into deep water, but create a supporting, um, not just a talent, anyone, by the way, a supporting structure, right? When you change a job. Yeah, yeah. So actually, have someone who helps you get on board and uh, and gives you background information on board, you helps you, supports you, and then your success rate is even higher, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the way it was defined that uh, this deep water is below fifty percent, where you know it is more likely that you will not succeed, and above sixty-six, it's called routine, and that's the problem. Yeah. So that's why it has to be in between okay. a healthy challenge. <laughs> Guys, this is a very, very interesting, interesting discussion. We are coming uh, slowly to an end. So let's try uh, before the Q&A to summarize uh, what are the, the key or the crucial uh, takeaways from our today's discussion. So if I understood correctly, and please add on to, to, to what, I will, what I will now, now say. Uh, first of all, we need to realize it is an ongoing process. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a two activities thing. It's something that is uh, moving constantly in the continuum. Second thing, uh, uh, if we are working, for example, in an international corporation, it is very important to have aligned approach in order to give uh, uh, a different types of opportunities and perspectives for the people who are, uh, let's call them high potentials or talents. 
third thing to have a really sound definition what talent is for your company within the company what does it mean which which types of skills experiences uh, it it requires and uh, uh, basically uh, that the development is crucial and we are moving away uh, from the traditional uh, traditional view of uh, development from formal trainings and just classroom classroom experiences but we are uh, moving towards uh, learning on the job uh, knowledge exchange with our within our colleagues towards mentoring constant coaching and nurturing our talents in 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 that way uh, also, we mentioned, and you guys mentioned, uh, uh, engagement as one of the one of the crucial aspects in in talent management. Uh, talent management. So basically, did I miss something? Is there something else that we need to highlight now at at the end of the session? I think there is one really important thing that we were talking about is to make your management responsible for talent. I think it's really important. You have to uh, provide a burning platform for them. Why it's important. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. That absolutely makes sense. Thanks. In our case, uh, there was one more topic that we wanted to address with our program, and that was um, that we didn't want to create a mass product. And that, that is, again, something company-specific yeah, you can consider. Uh, how much a mass product there will be that will be sent to many employees and available to all versus uh, fine-tuned for individual needs. And we went for very little standard, highly individualized solution, um, which takes a lot of effort, but is very much appreciated. Um, in our case, it is also needed because we are in an agile organization where flexibility is anyway expected uh, overall. Um, and that is reflected then also in our program. Uh, there's no uh, strict deadlines, no timeline of application. We're constantly hiring, constantly available. Everybody has their own. Um, the process starts for everybody in their own pace. Everything is adapted to own needs. And um, that is also something that can be considered as an, as an alternative versus if it's not possible, then there are very good solutions for doing mass um, offers. Thanks, Kata. I, I would agree. Uh, please, uh, everyone from the audience, uh, uh, feel free to send in Q&A your comments or uh, questions if you have for our speakers. This is the unique opportunity to have them. In the meantime, Violetta, if I may, uh, I just want to emphasize the difference between performance and potential. We have touched it several times, and uh, I really feel that these are different things and usually not, uh, you know, walking hand in hand. Uh, according to the 8 cubes model, you know, if the person is high on performance and maybe low on potential, your task uh, in HR, I would say, is to, to keep this person, but with different tools. Not Do not put this person into a talent management program. If the person is high on potential, low on performance, uh, you have to support. And if the person is high on both, then you can think about talent management and promoting this person. So these are really different things and have to be also measured with different you know, tools and ways. And I mean, what we also had a look once is, um, is even a, an alternative version of it, of having a look at performance and really the, the learning agility of uh, people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I also like uh, uh, the famous equation where performance is equal with talent plus effort. And if you rearrange the sentence, then talent is performance uh, minus, minus effort, which is called the effortless performance rule. If, if you can identify <laughs> in someone that the person can really do something without an effort and still an okay performance, then it is a sign, at least for me, that the person should be talented in that area. And if the person will put an extra effort next to the talent, it will be an amazing performance, which is another indicator of being talented in a certain area, the so-called maximum performance rule, as we used to call it. Cool. Thank you, Gabor. A lot of interesting facts you shared. So we have one more minute. Is there something that uh, you would like uh, to put in as a, as a final words, as a, as a message or as a question to, to, uh, for us to think about? Dora, Kata? 
Gabor. I think just uh, just one more thing uh, uh, according to the to the talent uh, programs. If you are desiring uh, designing talent programs, you have to identify the the target groups. And I'm really talking about uh, decisions about you would like to find only leadership talents or you would like to prepare for professional talent programs as well, or you put all uh, the junior, uh, let's say, potentials or um, as a pool uh, where you make uh, uh, experts. So these are also questions you have to face uh, within your company and then make decisions. Yeah, or, or to make it even more varied, you can consider what is the need that they all have and what are the differences between these target groups that you need to offer them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I think that's, that's it. Uh, it was a very pleasant uh, uh, experience uh, to hear about what you are doing, how you are doing it within your company, and to, to shed a bit more light uh, on the experiments and uh, talent discoveries. So everyone, of course, who participated, thank you for your time. Uh, we will be uh, sending out, of course, the recording of the webinar where you will have the opportunity to, to see uh, the slides once again. And of course, at, at the end of the presentation, there are our contact uh, uh, data. So feel free to reach out whenever uh, you need something or you want to ask something related to, to talents. So basically, uh, this is it, and uh, see you next time on Assessment Systems webinars. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Kata. Thank you very much, Dora, and thanks, Gabor. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. It was a really nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.